I'm really excited for the opportunity to present my vision today um, about what I call an artificial chemical intelligence. And by that, I do not mean some evil algorithm that will make all the chemists unemployed. Quite on the contrary, I mean a set of tools that will hopefully be useful for experimental chemists to facilitate and guide the chemical discovery process. And before I go into the details of how um, I, I think about of achieving this, I want to um, present my uh, or introduce my favorite concept in science, which is that of the chemical space. It's a bit of an abstract concept that really just means uh, the entirety of all possible chemical molecules, um, which you, I guess, could see as like stars in space, as well as all their properties and all the reactions that can occur, which you could see as connections between the individual stars in this space. And if you think about it like this, chemistry as a science has been around for about 100, 200 years, and every experiment that is performed is like an exploration into this vast chemical space that um, we mark on the map, which is our chemical literature, which we can go and look up what we know about this chemical space. And if we do this, we see that over this time, uh, we have accumulated knowledge of about 100 million or so chemicals and about the same number of chemical reactions. And this is quite an impressive number. It's a lot of molecules if you think about it. But then again, it has been estimated that this chemical space and, uh, could encompass uh, somewhere on the order of 10 to the power of 60 possible different uh, small organic molecules. And this number is just so incredibly large, it's really hard to think about what that even means. Um, it's like the, the, the fraction of uh, what we have so far explored of this chemical space to, the, to this entire size is some, it's similar to the mass of, say, a cat to the mass of the entire universe. So um, there are a lot of things out there that we can still discover. And um, the question really becomes how to navigate this space if we know so little about it at this point. And why would I want to think about this? Why is this important? Well, modern life really depends on so many highly engineered molecules that are, that are a lot of research effort is spent into sculpting molecules that have very defined shape and, and function and, and reactivity. And uh, for example, uh, this affects uh, drug molecules, of course, just the same as catalysts. Um, in, in a drug discovery campaign that can take 10 years, typically thousands of molecules are synthesized in order to find the one that's really the best for the, for the uh, purpose at hand. And uh, you can imagine, of course, synthesizing and testing thousands of molecules takes a lot of time and resources. And in the end, we might not even be able to find the very best molecule because the space, the search space was just so large. Um, or in other words, when we, when we look for molecules with well-defined reactivities or properties. It's like looking for a needle in a really large haystack. Of course, uh, chemistry has been doing fine all this time uh, by looking or doing this search uh, in a mostly empirical and intuitive way. But uh, using machine learning to guide this search has actually gained a lot of interest in recent years. And this is what I want to uh, focus on in, in my own research as well. So the premise there is really, can we uh, make use of a, of a set of experiments that we have obtained in the lab, extract information that's, that's present in this data uh, about how these molecules have behaved, and use it to suggest the next set of experiments that will ideally lead to a better performing set of molecules. So say in the context of catalysis. Usually we're looking at one reaction that can be catalyzed by a number of catalysts. And uh, say we have tested uh, a set, maybe 10 or so catalysts, and we obtain varying yields of our desired product, but it's not really, uh, we don't obtain a clean product and high yield, so that is not optimal. Um, now the idea is to take this information on those 10 molecules and suggest another set of catalysts that will ideally um, result in higher yields. Okay, so this is, this is where we uh, would start. We have a set of molecules and some associated experimental data. And then, broadly speaking, the idea is to somehow translate what the molecule 
um, looks like to a computer. And I will uh, explain that in some more detail in a moment because this is actually quite a, a critical step. And then we could hope to connect whatever we've chosen to describe the molecules with the experimental data to find models that um, can uh, explain and predict this chemical reactivity and then somehow devise another set of models that would be able to suggest new structures that we can then take to the experiment for validation, actually carry out the, the, the catalysis and obtain hopefully better yields of the desired product. So I mentioned it's a problem or it's, it's really important how to represent a molecule to the computer. The fundamental problem is that molecules are discrete entities, whereas, of course, all statistical methods work with numbers. And numbers, of course, are continuous. So you can pick any number or any two numbers, and there will always be a number in between. And in fact, those numbers will always be very similar as well, compared to the entire rest of conceivable numbers. But in molecules, this is absolutely not the case, because first of all, in our building blocks, we are limited to the choice of elements from the periodic table. And there is just no way to pick any constituent between, say, carbon and nitrogen. There's nothing in between that. And even if we say we take a molecule, such as a simple thing like ethane, and we change one of the carbons for either one of the neighboring elements, like nitrogen or silicon, which just looking at the periodic table looks like a very small change. This is a dramatic change for the molecules. These three molecules are chemically completely different. The, the reactivity almost couldn't be more, more uh, disparate. Uh, by their elemental composition, they are very similar. Their reactivity is completely dissimilar. So that means we need to find a way to represent these molecules to the computer in such a way that it would understand that these are in fact very dissimilar and it would be able to then suggest other molecules with obviously different composition that have reactivities in between these two, say. There are different approaches that have been uh, taken for this task, and uh, they all come with their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, my uh, preferred method uh, makes use of simulations and uh, taking various molecular properties from these simulations. So. Uh, Running uh, uh, simulations of molecules can be done with very high accuracy these days using quantum mechanical uh, software that uh, for someone like me who is traditionally an experimentalist, these are essentially tools. And then what we can use and uh, what we can do with these simulations is look at the molecules and, and uh, look at various properties that we think are relevant for their reactivity, like how large are they? How is the size distributed around the molecule? Uh, how is the charge distributed? This affects how they will react with other molecules, things like this. And we can make a table and essentially look up all these properties from our simulations for each molecule that we have uh, in, in our experiments. And then suddenly we have, created, uh, we have created a, a descriptor matrix that has turned the molecules, the discrete entities, into a large table of numbers where, in fact, similar numbers will refer to similar molecules in terms of their chemical reactivity. Well, this is useful for, uh, for, for the uh, statistical algorithms that we can uh, use them with. Actually, uh, we can think, easily think of 100 or so properties. So this is not an intuitive table to, to look at. And uh, now this is where we come back to our chemical space idea, because we can uh, use unsupervised machine learning techniques to transform this highly dimensional descriptor matrix into a lower dimensional representation. For example, a two dimensional representation that we can uh, plot and look at. And uh, I will uh, go into what exactly we can do with this in, in just a second. And then the really exciting part is um, what I, uh, when, you know, I mentioned that when we, when we start with a set of experiments, we have somewhere like 10 or so data points, maybe 100 if we're lucky. So this is nowhere near big data. We cannot really use highly sophisticated machine learning models to perform this task up to here. But the good thing about the simulations is we can do that with a lot more molecules. We can simulate on this level that, I'm, that we are requiring here, hundreds or thousands of molecules perhaps. So that means Although we've started from a data set, maybe 10 or, or a dozen or so um, um, samples large, we can 
in our chemical space representation, we end up with a lot more data. So that means we can also employ more advanced machine learning algorithms that then learn how the molecular structure links each molecule to its place in this chemical space. And we can extrapolate for any, any structure that we can think of using these models and really populate this chemical space much, much more densely, easily with a million uh, estimated samples. Then it becomes very clear how we can use this workflow to start suggesting new catalysts to the experimentalists. Because if we have identified uh, that a certain region of this chemical space is beneficial for the chemical reaction, we can essentially go and look up so many candidates that we can then still filter by other criteria and suggest to the experiment. And um, I've mentioned that this chemical space representation is supposed to be intuitive, and you'll probably not believe me if I just show this somewhat boring two-dimensional plot of just black squares. Um, but in fact, we can uh, take each of these points and color code it with properties that we know as chemists that are independent of the descriptors that we have used to construct this map. And ideally, if we have chosen the representation in a, in a meaningful way that it actually captures chemical reactivity, uh, you will see what actually happens here is that groups that we know to be chemically similar will appear in similar regions. So that means the premise actually works. We can say this is a related class of molecules. The, and, and as you see, it's kind of convoluted, of course, but generally similar molecules come up in similar areas. And this is crucial for guiding experiments. Uh, even uh, this is uh, going back to, to the analogy I gave with the numbers. Now we can actually say uh, points that are close in this space will chemically also behave similar. And this is an example from a project that I carried out with an experimental group working in the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, the first thing we did here, you can see this is fewer points. We can filter the, the chemical space representation that we've started with by criteria such as commercial availability, which is important for them because then they can just buy the catalyst components. And they have run a set of uh, experiments using um, catalysts that uh, you can see cover this uh, chemical space fairly evenly and I've color coded the yield that they have obtained of the product they needed. And what you can see is at first they only really had two ligands that provided any yield of the product. So of course with two points you cannot, you cannot really uh, do any fancy regression analysis that will give you very specific relationships of structure and reactivity. But what we can do and what we have done is look up a candidate that is very close in this chemical space to the two catalysts that we knew to be active in this reaction. We suggested it to the experimenter. And you can see, in fact, its reactivity was very similar to the two previous catalysts. And looking at it from a chemical perspective, they, they do look fairly similar. But um, that just further validates that in this, uh, in this space representation, similarity really tracks uh, for the numbers as well as the reactivity. The really exciting part about this is we can, we can take our chemical space representation and because now we have a larger data set, more samples, because we can essentially simulate as many molecules as we want, but still a limited number. As I said, about a thousand is a reasonable number. Uh, we can then use more abstract descriptors that a variety of them have been developed and I don't really want to go into the details these could be graphs, kind of annotated graphs that take a molecule and represent it in, in terms of its connections and assign numbers to each um, vertex and, and so on in the graph. And we could use more uh, involved models such as random forests or neural networks and this precise choice will always depend on the exact, uh, on the exact system we're studying. But once we have a model that can relate molecular structure to the uh, the position of each molecule in the chemical space, we can then really fill in that chemical space with as many points as we, as we need. And, and then once again, if, if I just go back to, to our map where we've assigned 
experimental yield to each point in space. Now, if we had the complete, um, uh, the, the, you know, with the other model that uh, extrapolated the um, properties of a million uh, compounds, we can just go to this region and pick as many catalyst structures as we feel the experimental group might even want to synthesize. Uh, so the, the concepts that I've uh, presented so far, uh, we've been working on them, we're still perfecting them, there's a lot of room to, for improvement still, but the, the really fascinating question is, can we apply these concepts of thinking about positions in chemical space, not just for molecules, but for entire reactions? Can we represent the connection between molecules, which is the chemical reaction, in such a condensed chemical space representation, and can we use that to find new chemical reactions that have not been uh, discovered before? And if we had such a tool, I think this would be very transformative as a computational tool for experimental chemistry to facilitate and streamline the discovery process and allow us to make all these highly engineered molecules that we have uh, described in the previous sections of the talk. And I hope I could inspire you as well with this vision, and I thank you for your attention.